Almost. Got it. Ah, there's nothing like Christmas, eh, Gambit? No, oh, you can't speak. You're a cat. You know, Gambit, the Christmas tree stands for so much. It stands for peace and love and joy. And man, this tree right here is perfection. It's a shame it isn't mine. Ah, much better. Hmm, smells like that orphanage from last week. Oh Christmas, a time for giving, receiving, family, friends, and everything wonderful in this world. That's why I hate it. Nah, I'm just kidding. But as Christmas gets more and more extravagant every year, people tend to forget the simpler pleasures that in the not-too-distant past made Christmas truly magical for all of us. The little things, like the smell of mother's apple pie, the time spent hanging out and waiting for everyone to wake up, the feeling of seeing the tree with all the presents, and everything in between. And while some frankly horrible people argue about not getting the newest iPhone or gaming console, the people who still enjoy Christmas for the holiday itself hold to heart what the holiday is about in the first place. Unity. The unity that binds us all together. And with that, many people have Christmas traditions to recapture that feeling of happiness, childlike wonder, and unity. Put your pants back on, I said unity, not nudity. Now you may be wondering where I'm going with this. But actually, in speaking of Christmas traditions, this will be my third year with a somewhat, shall we say, unorthodox Christmas tradition. Now, I may have made a few subtle hints that I'm a Zelda fan. What I like about this level is one of the things I like about the Legend of Zelda series. Oh yeah, she stabbed me with my replica Master Sword. However, I officially became a Zelda fan in December 2013, and ever since then it's been my tradition to, during the week leading up to Christmas, play and beat the game that made me a fan of the series, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. That's a cliche. And I hear a lot about how this game is amazeballs as seen by its 99 on Metacritic. What? But rarely do I ever hear an explanation as to why it's amazeballs. So you know what? That's what we're gonna do today. But first... Which version of this game should I play? I don't have any capture card equipment for my 3DS. We're not playing the N64 version cause the controller can suck my nut. I played this version last year, so I guess we're going with this one. As the game opens up, you get this really peaceful and harmonious intro screen. I really hate this word because it bears about as much relevance to the overall quality of a product as my relevance to the overall quality of the lives of single women. Lonely. I'm Mr. Lonely, I have nobody for my own. But this intro is really cinematic. The way it shows the sweeping landscapes, the way the music plays, and the way the logo fades in and out, it looks like the intro of a big time movie. And speaking of the music, it's beautiful. Already, just through what you've seen, you have investment in the story. You already feel the emotion of this game, of yearning, of triumph, of defeat, of love and loss and more. All of that from a title screen. Or maybe I'm just talking out of my ass. It's masterfully presented and we haven't even gotten past the intro screen yet. And it really makes you excited for- Ah! Moving on. Now, when I play The Legend of Zelda, when I don't name Link- Link, you know his name, I like to name him something that makes every dialogue unintentionally funny. There's always the option to name him Zelda and turn everybody in the game into the average dipshit non-gamer who's never touched a fucking Zelda game and makes me want to take suicide pills! Which is well enough because these things are hard to find this time of year. But I digress. This time I chose the fuck. The results will be posted later. Immediately one of the most prominently visible aspects of the game pops right out at you. Come to think of it, the only prominently visible aspect of the game, the graphics. Now, some might say that this game doesn't hold up graphically. In fact, some might say it looks like shit. 
I'm just going to leave this picture of Yatsu Kroshaw here for no reason. I have this term I like to use called as good as it needs to be, which I know is a cop-out argument usually made by people trying to justify buying a sex bone. And truth be told, this game does look like cheese from an objective standpoint. The facial animation is designated to flat textures on faces, everything's very pixely, the pre-rendered backgrounds look more blurry than Minecraft being played on a Commodore 64 hooked up to a potato. So yes, this game hasn't aged well graphically, but total pixel capacity is not the end-all be-all in graphics, and this game is colorful, the draw distance is great, and overall it has an appealing art style, and while for some that may not be enough, it's enough for me. I'm also not a very good reviewer, so... So, if you've ever played a Zelda game before, you might be able to guess the plot of this one. But chances are you'd be wrong. I'll try and get through this as fast as I can. The game opens up from a very sober beginning with the Great Deku Tree telling Navi, your soon-to-be companion, to bring you to him because he senses a great evil falling upon the land and Destiny says that the fuck will dispel that evil and save Hyrule. You go inside the Great Deku Tree and destroy the poison that Ganondorf used on the tree, but it's too late. He dies, but not before telling you to go to Hyrule Castle and contact the Princess Zelda about what's going on and also giving you the spiritual stone of the forest. So some faffing, and you find the princess who instantly trusts you in spite of the fact that you just broke into the castle and tells you the legend of the sacred realm and the Triforce, and then you see Ganondorf in person for the first time. Then Zelda instructs you to find the three spiritual stones that will open up the sacred realm, all within five minutes of knowing you. Clearly this chick is a few fries short of a Happy Meal. <sighs> so you go to Death Mountain, but the leader of the Gorons, Darunia, won't speak to you until you cheer him up with a song you learned from Saria, Link's childhood friend. And then you find out that the Dodongo Cavern, their primary food resource, was sealed. So you go in and deal with the cavern, then you get the spiritual stone of fire for saving the Gorons. Then from there, you go to the Zora Cavern to get the spiritual stone of water. However, the Zora Princess, Rudo, is nowhere to be found. So you find a note that leads you to Jabu Jabu who eats you. JK. You find Rudo who won't leave unless you carry her, physically carry her, to her precious jewel. <laughs> Whoops. So you find it, and then she gets captured. Ha! Ungrateful cut! So you rescue her, and she gives you the spiritual stone of water, which in you asking her to give you it is also you proposing to her. So now you make your way to Hyrule Castle, but Ganondorf has attacked the castle, and Zelda escapes with her protector, Impa, and throws the Ocarina of Time at Link, who then has a face-to-face -face confrontation with Ganondorf. That goes about as well as you'd expect. With the Ocarina, the three spiritual stones, and the Song of Time, you open the door to the Sacred Realm, and then Ganondorf walks right in and takes the Triforce. Get on fucked up now! You wake up seven years later and the Sage of Light Rawr! explains you were sealed away until you were ready to stop Ganondorf. Now you need to awaken five other sages, and then once you get back to the Temple of Time, a mysterious person named Sheik helps you out. You go to the Forest Temple to awaken Saria as the Forest Sage, then a new Deku Tree sprouts who explains Link's backstory, then the Fire Temple at Death Mountain to awaken Dur Runia as the Fire Sage and to save the Gorons from being sacrificed. Then you go to the Zora Caverns that are frozen, so you have to go to the Water Temple to help Rudo, who was previously unfrozen by Sheik, destroy the evil that froze the Zoras and in doing so awakens her as the Sage of Water, which means they can't get married. Then a great evil that Impa imprisoned breaks out of captivity in Kakariko Village, so you have to go to the Shadow Temple to defeat it, and in doing so awakes Impa as the Shadow Sage. Then you go to the Gerudo Desert and break some carpenters out of jail to gain the Gerudo's trust. Hmm. I'll have to remember that next time I want to gain a woman's trust. Somehow I feel like this is misinformed. Then, you cross the desert to the Spirit Temple. You go back in time and help the Gerudo Naburu who gets captured. You then come back to regular time and complete the Spirit Temple and awaken Naburu as the Spirit Sage. You then go to the Temple of Time and Sheik appears. And plot twist, it was Zelda all along. She gives you the tools to destroy Ganondorf and then she herself gets captured by Ganondorf. So you have to go to his castle, pass six trials, climb the tower and have a final showdown with Ganondorf. The tower collapses, then you face his true form. Ganon. Then you defeat him, he's sealed in the sacred realm, and Zelda apologizes to Link for everything and sends him back in time to live his lost years. Navi flies away, roll credits. <gasps> so not the average Zelda plot, eh? A lot of what makes the story great in this game is so subtle some people don't even notice. Loss of innocence is a central theme in this story as both Zelda and the fuck are yanked from their peaceful lives and forced by their own destinies to prematurely grow up and quickly learn the skills to end the rule of Ganondorf. You see, after a somewhat low-key first act, the fuck is put into the Hylian equivalent of cryosleep for seven years because he wasn't ready to be the hero of time yet. Thanks for the heads up, you Deku fucker! So he wakes up after seven years as an adult with no preparation or understanding of what to do and is forced into the world with endless responsibility, still emotionally a child but physically an adult and one who never asked for any of this to happen. Dear God, 
He's like a high school graduate. Zelda, on the other hand, has her home, life, and position as princess taken away when Ganondorf attacks Hyrule Castle and presumably kills her family to get the Ocarina of Time. Then spends the next seven years training in secret under the alias of Sheik, having her caretaker, Impa, being her only link to the past. I did a pun! Who, by the way, looks like the love child of China and Draco Malfoy. Though they differ in execution, both the fuck and Zelda start out as starry-eyed children and over the course of the game have that all stripped away until they are shells of who they want were. And with that, the first act is very deceptive. There's a lot of time faffing and talking to characters and doing mostly fuck all between dungeons, but the general lacking speed and faff creates an atmosphere of realism. It subtly immerses you in the world, and it does a great job of establishing likability to all the NPCs, as well as a very keen friendship with people like Mido, Darunia, Rudo, and especially Surya, who in the brief time you have with her establishes an incredibly touching friendship, all within the first three hours of gameplay. And in having you get to know the world you live in is why it's all the more shocking when the plot twist at the end of the first act happens when Ganondorf gets the Triforce, becomes supreme ruler, and systematically turns Hyrule into Hiroshima. Hyrule Shima, if you would. Tough crowd. Though I admit that the main talking parts of the story take a back seat somewhat in the second act in favor of focusing on gameplay and awakening the five stages, there are still some really good bits. For example, every single thing Sheik says is gold-plated pretentious philosophy that is actually really intelligent and meaningful. And the things that each sage says to you as you awaken them are actually really touching, especially Surya's emotional goodbye. Although Naburu is kind of creepy. If only I knew you would become such a handsome man. Sorry ma'am, not into pixels. But the third act is where both gameplay and story gets kicked into high gear when Zelda gives the fuck the tools he needs to destroy Ganondorf and then gets kidnapped. Each of the important side characters get their moments to shine, and the sequence that really stands out is Ganondorf's monologue right before you fight him, because everything that happened in his castle, and by extension the game, built up to that moment, and you can cut the tension with a Then, after you defeat him, there's a touching and emotional goodbye between Zelda and the fuck. There's a ton of small details in this game that add so many layers to the story, like how you are gradually told the history of Hyrule, the Triforce, the Three Gods, the Sacred Realm, Ganondorf, and more. You even get told the fuck's backstory and the death of his mother during the Hylian Civil War and how he ended up in the Kokiri tribe. That's fucked up! However, what's said is great, but sometimes what isn't said is even greater. And that brings me to arguably the biggest strength that this story has to offer, visual storytelling. Now, what is visual storytelling? Well, do you remember show and tell? Well, imagine that, but you don't tell, you just show, and let your class piece together what this mysterious vibrating purple sword you found in your mother's sock drawer really is and what its purpose is. This game is full of showing without telling, especially in the second act where the main story takes a back seat. For example, you get a sense of Ganondorf's rule when you see how bustling the market in... Um... Hyrule Castle Town? Creative. But then after you go to the future, you see the devastation. It doesn't tell you directly what happened, but you know because of the way the game presents itself. The friendship between the fuck, okay enough of that, Link and Epona is apparent because the horse still responds to him after seven years apart. Sheik's off-screen training is also never referenced, but you know it's there because they don't have to tell you. But the absolute best part of the visual storytelling is the ending. Spoiler alert, I suppose, but I forgot to put a spoiler alert when I was summarizing the story, so I guess I'm a florist because I just picked a whole bouquet of oopsie daisies. During the end credits, when everybody's celebrating on Lon Lon Ranch, King Zora and Mido sit out, seemingly mourning. And that made me consider that Mido lost Link and Saria, two of his best friends, and King Zora lost Rudo, his daughter but that also made me consider the personality and psychological damages of Link himself. When Link gets sent back in time for the final time, he loses everything. His best friend, his Goron brother, his fiance. Well, to be fair, she was about as appealing as having sex with a literal pile of shit. Two people who saved his life and the woman he loved. On top of that, he's mentally grown up and is now an adult in a child's body. Like a pedophile from Opposite Land. I'm sorry. Who went through hell to save Hyrule, yet nobody remembers what he did except his companion who flies away in the end. Plus, he now knows he's not a Kokiri, so he really has nowhere to go. And that leads me to believe that the entire experience that Link has gone through by the end of the game has gradually destroyed him psychologically. None of this was directly mentioned, but that's what's so good about Link's characters that so many details are left up for the player to infer for themselves that even the aspects that are mostly concrete can be interpreted differently. And none of that would have been possible had Link not been a silent protagonist. He has the personality that we give him and that's why he will forever be considered one of the greatest protagonists in video games. Because he will forever be you, me, and everyone else who plays these games. Which is not to say that I'm psychologically damaged or anything.
What? As for everyone else, I touched on Zelda earlier, but she really is an interesting character. Sure, now you have quite a few games where Zelda is more than just a plot device, but when this game came out, it was the first time Zelda had any sort of character. Well, except for... <laughs> And she comes across as intelligent and a competent fighter filled with heart and determination. And as much as I hate to sound like Anita Sar- I'm sorry saying that name made me spontaneously choke. As much as I'd hate to sound like... Her. Zelda never boils down to simply being the damsel in distress. Even when she does get captured as inevitably as the fucking sunrise, she still has enough personality that she's more than just a reward. In fact, during a sequence near the end, Link and Zelda actually work together and save each other several times. Yeah, consider that! Though I have to admit, the shocking twist that Sheik is actually Zelda is about as shocking as a glass of water containing water. Though I do actually know somebody who didn't know that Sheik was Zelda until a friend of mine offhandedly mentioned it, and then when he found out, he was like, what? And I was like, now I'm dizzy. Then there's Ganondorf. Okay, I guess he's pretty generically evil, but still, he's pretty badass. He's a magical wizard, he plays the organ, he likes to monologue, he's got a kick-ass cape that clips through his legs, and while I wouldn't say he's anything spectacular, he's still effectively hateable and incredibly awesome. At least until you defeat him. See that? That right there is the face of bad shrooms. As for most of the other characters, I can describe them in three words or less. Douche. Fat. Sexual predator. Actual predator. My personality. Lazy. Hyrule's got talent. Perpetual desert strippers. More lazy. Witch. Witch. What am I on about? And lastly, there's the five sages. Soria, who as I mentioned, has a really touching friendship with Link to the point where you can actually call her any time for advice. It's a shame he throws away her ocarina when he gets a new one. Oh, Link. Link, you, um... You fucking a- Darunia, the king of the Gorons, noble and stubborn, with a heart of gold and the rhythm of a walrus. Motherfuckers got the moves like Jagger! You know what this calls for, right? Rudo, who is a total cunt until you rescue her. Bad touch, bad touch, bad touch! Then I guess she's totally into you. Hun, we're both ten and you're blue. This will either end in bitter divorce or with repulsive children. Was that racist? Unfortunately, Impa, Naburu, and Raru aren't in this game long enough to establish personalities beyond being righteous and being against Ganondorf. Honestly though, I could go on for hours about the strong points of the story, but my point is thus. The first time playing through this game, I took everything at face value and did not think about anything too much. The second time, I looked at every single detail and thought very deeply about the story and characters. And I enjoyed it just as much both times. It's the type of game where no matter how much or how little you think about the story, it's just as good every time. Ma, where's dinner? Who the fuck are you? As I touched on earlier, the music is classic. It's funny because the sound quality on the PS1 was usually better, what with the disc space being what it was, you could have completely uncompressed music on the PS1. Some of my favorite video game soundtracks of this era include Symphony of the Night, the Spyro Trilogy, couldn't go one fucking review without mentioning Spyro, Ape Escape, or some lesser knowns like Nightmare Creatures or The Legend of Dragoon. But Ocarina of Time might just blow all of those games out of the water. What it lacks in overall sound quality, it makes up for in catchiness and adding atmosphere. The house theme is happy and jaunty, the Hyrule Field theme is epic and resembles a story being told through music the way it plays from beginning to end, the Lon Lon Ranch theme that's so peaceful it's almost sickening, practically childhood innocence, the song. I could talk about the intensity of the boss battle themes, or the evil maniacal bastardry of Ganondorf's theme, or the old western style of the Gerudo Valley theme, but the most prominent and arguably the best music in the game is the titular Ocarina music. Although in spite of the game being called Ocarina, Arena of Time, the cover still has a sword and shield on it, which still confuses me. I should learn how to play the flute. Hmm. Perfect. Well, you have Zelda's Lullaby, Classic, Song of Storms, Awesome, Sun Song, Great, Song of Time, Epic and Foreboding, Saria Song, Jaunty and Happy, and the epic temple themes that you get taught by Sheik. Well, at least when she's not being tossed around like Psycho Mantis having a seizure. Ah, 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 ah. Like the prelude of light, the minute of forest, the bolero of fire, the serenade of water. But, but there's, there's one, one more song, song that's, that's more epic than, than you can possibly imagine. imagine.
I have to admit though, the actual sound effects are lacking. There's no voice acting, which is par for the course with Zelda games, but without it, the only sound you usually hear is <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, little game design tip, by the way, uh, yes, yeah, so, don't make rolling faster than walking! I heard my name. Oh, shoot! There are fighting sound effects, walking sound effects, I heard I said shoot! Various yells and battle cries, but beyond that, there really isn't much to the sound effects. But the music, however, is dynamic, skillfully put together, and adds enough atmosphere that I can forgive the minimalist sound engineering. Now, before we continue, let's see the results of the fuck's unintentional funnies. <laughs> You did not disappoint, Ocarina of Time. Now we've come to the crux of the issue. How does the gameplay hold up? Well, here's how it works. The game is based around the triple-headed gameplay of puzzles, exploration, and combat. The holy triforce of Zelda game design, if you will. A is the various use action button, but usually you only use it to roll like a fat person down a hill. I'm sorry, was that not PC enough for you? Here's a picture of a puppy. B is the attack button, the C buttons are used for changing weapons, going into first person mode, and responding to Navi, if only to make her shut the hell up. But she never does. Z centers the camera and is also the lock on button, and then R guards. Half of this game is spent in the world exploring, progressing through various challenges and whatnot, and the other half is spent in the dungeons of the temples of the... whatever you want to call I don't know. You earn various items as you progress through the game, each of which helps you solve new puzzles and in combat, with each item having a dungeon dedicated to them. Combat is designated to sword fights, with each new enemy having different attack patterns. Well, no shit. But you can also use various items in combat, but very few are as useful as the sword. There are also various side quests you can do, like collecting all the gold skatulas to get rewards. Or work for the happy mask salesman to bring happiness to Hyrule! Hold the phone. I swear I have seen that guy before. Oh god! Some of it you need, but quite a lot of it isn't needed unless you're going for 100% completion, or you just want all the pieces of heart which are scattered throughout the world and give you more health. Some of which are found through side quests, and some of which are found through exploring, encouraging, experimentation. Hey, what are you doing explaining shiz like we don't already know? Well, I want to explain the mechanics in detail to provide proper context. You a sexy motherfucker. Sure. The quickest way to make action boring is to make it routine, and that's what this game understands. You would get bored of it if it was all one thing, and so it juxtaposes its action with exploration and puzzles, usually utilizing an item you found. So it peaks and it troughs, and each peak feels fresh alongside each trough, and vice versa. In the dungeons, there are new mechanics constantly being introduced, even as late as Ganondorf's castle, from jumping onto spider webs to break them, opening doorways with bombs, clearing doorways by boomeranging literal dangling pieces of poop, and that's just in the first three dungeons. Speaking of dungeons, I'm aware of the fact that the Water Temple has a reputation for being kind of frustrating in the same way that Hitler has a reputation for being kind of a dick, but believe it or not, I didn't find it that hard. The first two times I played this game, I got stuck, but they were both my fault for being inept, but this time it took me an hour and 20 minutes. But you know what I did have a problem with? The fucking forest temple. It doesn't matter how many times I play that temple, I can never get past the incessant backtracking, the bullshit puzzles, the slow ass puzzles, and everything else that just takes four times longer than it needed to be. In total this time, it took me about two and a half hours to complete. And aside from Ganondorf, it had the only other boss I died on. Drum roll, please. Phantom Ganondorf. Hey, let's make you fight the final boss halfway through the game and see how you do. I see no problem with this, said Shigeru Miyamoto as he snorted another line of coke. Weird difficulty curve aside, the dungeons and the temples are the best part of the game. It's where the gameplay truly shines. There are some rooms where you need to fight for your life, some rooms where you need to solve puzzles, some of which are reoccurring and some of which only appear once, and sometimes you need to do both in one room. The combat is on the level of hard enough that there's no fucking around, but also on the level that it's rarely frustrating. Well, there are some frustrating fights, but not too many. And there's also a surprising amount of different attacks you can do depending on whether or not you're locked on, what button you press, what direction you press, and more. And all things considered, it's a very elegantly designed fighting system. It's never too hard or too simple. The one flaw I can say is that the lock-on system only works when it wants to, so this can lead to some frustration, but it's not too big of a problem because for every bit of frustration there's 10 times the amount of exciting and challenging sword fights. Although I guess I'm a little bit disappointed that this Master Sword doesn't shoot beams like in previous games. I mean, my Master Sword does.
Then there's the puzzles. They are really quite cleverly designed. Even the reoccurring puzzles are usually well designed and well implemented. There is a tutorial, but it doesn't teach you any of this. So for instance, you need to open this door. There's a lit torch, an unlit torch, and you have flammable sticks. One plus two equals fire! For a game like this, there needs to be a balance of intuitive design and critical thinking. And while it does waver off that balance a few times, cough, forced temple, cough, from deflecting light beams to shooting eyeballs, there was never a moment where I truly felt stumped, but I always found myself thinking about what the best solution to a puzzle would be. If there is one criticism I can give the dungeons though, it's that I feel like there should have been more of them. I heard that there was going to be as many as three more, but due to space limitations, they had to be cut. And that probably affected the world itself as well, as there is a significant amount of backtracking both in and out of the dungeons, and it does wear a bit after a while, and it does make the world feel a bit small. But where they make up for that is the insane amount of creatures to fight. A few include Gaping Anus, Suicidal Skeleton, Mortal Kombat Cameo, Thing from the Addams Family, Your Mom. Do you have any games on your phone? <laughs> And then there's one more. I may have mentioned this guy earlier. Ah! Allow me to reiterate. Ah! Seriously, what the fuck is this thing? It doesn't look like it belongs in a Zelda game. It looks like something H.R. Geiger would see in a fever dream during a bad acid trip. This one guy is scarier than the entirety of Resident Evil 6. Each of these enemies are distinctly different both in fighting style and design, and they're all really well made. But the real standout are the bosses. Now, a lot of Zelda games are known for their bosses, and this is no exception. Now, I could talk about the amazing reveal of Goma, the spectacular fight with Dark Link, full Vagia's amazing hair? What's your secret? Take care. Gone here. The sheer scale of King Dodongo or the unorthodox but fantastic Bongo Bongo. Bongo Bongo Bongo, he don't wanna leave the Congo. All of these bosses are fantastic and really inventive and utilize each new mechanic perfectly, but there is one boss that is everything all these bosses are times 10. The final boss battle with Ganondorf is easily my favorite boss battle of all time. You start out at the bottom of his castle and through roadblock after roadblock you slowly ascend until you reach a giant staircase. And that organ music gets louder and louder as you ascend that staircase. It cements one thought in your brain. This is it. It all comes down to this. And you open the door and Ganondorf says those iconic words. And then you fight. All things considered, this first part is nothing more than a glorified tennis match. But it's actually really tense and challenging. Then, once you defeat him, he uses his powers to destroy the castle, so you have to escape the castle while it's collapsing. In a time limit. Once again, you constantly face roadblock after roadblock, then you finally escape and you see the tower collapse. Fun fact, the first time I played this game, I actually escaped with 1.34 seconds left. I'm not kidding, I felt like fucking John McClane. I mean to say I felt like John McClane, not I wanna, you know, fuck John McClane. Uh, back on topic. So you see the tower collapse, but it's not over yet, because Ganondorf unlocks his final form. Ganon. No subtitle, just Ganon. And at this point, you're practically shitting your pants because this guy is twice your size, you can't even really see him because of how dark it is, and every time he hits you, it deals out ridiculous damage. There are few things in this world more satisfying than that final sword thrust to the hilt into Ganon's forehead. What this boss does right is that it starts building tension as soon as you enter the castle, to the point that when you get to Ganondorf, it's gone from tension to like 15 <laughs> The hell is that? And aside from being very challenging, it also manages to keep that tension through the entire fight. What's more, it actually becomes more tense as the fight goes on. Yeah, each part of the fight tops the last. Then finally, after 20 minutes of fighting, you deliver that final blow. Then you just... You know. Now, I've said a lot of good things about this game, but there's a few notable flaws I need to get out of the way. First of all, Navi. The most infamous companion in video game history. Every time she wants to say something... Hey. Which is every three goddamn seconds, and sometimes three times in a second. Hey, hey, hey. Wait. Hey, hey, hey. Seriously, Navi is intolerable. I did kind of grow to like her by the end of the game, but even despite having a bit of a soft spot for her, she won't ever shut the hell up. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. <sighs> Hello? Do it! Hey, Jesus. Well, she is a woman, am I right? What's that? Oh, God, no. Second is the most infamous flaw with the game. The entire camera system is designated to the Z button. It's... Well, it's not good. 
all it does is center the camera so it can get in the way quite a bit. And sometimes you may just want to center the camera but it keeps locking onto people so it can get incredibly frustrating. Third is forced stealth. There are two instances of it in this game. The first one is quick and over with when you need to sneak into Hyrule Castle. It's not good, but it's manageable. Vigorous boredom. But the part where you need to sneak around the Gerudo Fortress to free the Carpenters is easily the worst part of the game. Seriously, it took me forever after like a million tries to finish that part. Hey desert strippers, either don't fucking bother or stick me in a cell without a window, otherwise you're just wasting both our times. Seriously though, this part is atrocious. They see you way too easily, there's no chance to fight back if you get caught, and the fortress is a giant maze, making it hard to gauge where you've been. So when you get sent back to the beginning, your guess is as good as mine as to where to go. It's a war of attrition and it sucks. But aside from that, there really aren't that many notable flaws I can think of. You see, this game, in my humblest of opinions, is one of the most finely crafted and immersive games I've ever played. Yeah, in spite of the dated graphics, I found myself more immersed in this game than Skyrim or Fallout or any other game. And the fact that this game sucked me in like no other game ever has made me overlook its flaws. Because... It's just that damn good. And while you can nitpick the finer points like saying the finding treasure animation is too long or that there's two separate cameras for gameplay and fighting or having to wait for people to stop talking or combat being too different from Link to the Past or having to time your attacks because sword fights are where two opponents just whack at each other non-stop until one falls down, that's realistic. Okay, don't want to burn that bridge just yet. The point is, Ocarina of Time made me a Zelda fan, and while it may not have aged well in a few respects, almost all of it has aged perfectly to the point where somebody who's never played a Zelda game can play it at the age of 17 with no nostalgia and still call it one of his favorite games of all time two years down the road. The funny thing is, I may have actually broken my own rule, because the point of unnostalgic reviews is to review games I have no nostalgia for, but I kind of have a strange nostalgia for this game. Not because it reminds me of better times long past, fuck no, two years ago is awful, but rather because this game is the good times long past. It's so good, it retroactively made those memories sweeter. And because of that, in spite of any flaws that this game may have, I cannot possibly say anything else but the fact that The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time does indeed 100% pass the nostalgia test. So, that's it. That is my Christmas special. So, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate, just happy holidays. Enjoy the moment and drink lots of booze. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. God damn it! Well, at least Nintendo's fairly easy going about their copyright policy. Fuck! What's up, people? The Generation Extreme here. Thanks for watching, and Merry fucking Christmas. Honestly, I am so happy I managed to get this video out on Christmas because there were so many setbacks in production and it ended up being about twice as long as I thought it was going to be. But it all worked out and I'm very thankful for that. So, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, maybe even go into the description and check out my Facebook and Twitter. Other than that, The Generation Extreme. Over, out, and Merry Christmas.